of the penal code. So at paragraph 175 was part of the German penal code is written and on the books since 1871. So from 1871 to 1969, it was part of the German penal code. And until the Nazis came into power, on average, a thousand men a year were arrested under the code. Um, when the Nazis came into power, then it was sort of paragraph 175 on steroids. And um, total arrests under the Nazi regime were 100,000. Uh, 50,000 of those were imprisoned. 10 to 15,000 were actually in concentration camps. And it's estimated that probably on average 60% of those in camps died while they were in the camps. So those that went to the camps were given the Pink Triangle. So that's how the Pink Triangle came about, was during the Nazi era uh, to mark homosexuals in, in the camps. So the, the law was, um, finally repealed in 69 in the West, 1969 in the West, and 1968 in the East. We were talking about that beforehand. It was interesting that it was repealed in the East before the West. Um, and in 2000, our film, Paragraph 175, premiered in Berlin at the Berlinale, and it really caused quite a conversation there. It was, it was great, and the aftermath of that uh, resulted in the German government for the first time recognizing that homosexuals were indeed victims of Nazi persecution. There were no reparations associated with that, but it was official government recognition, which many who had been victims were fighting <coughs> for that recognition for decades. Uh, thank you. I, I was wondering, when, when, when we speak of paragraph 175 today, and we look back at this at this history, um, you know, Magnus Hirschfeld was, was such a pioneer, uh, and his project was incomplete, and may even to, to some extent still be incomplete, but one of the, the ways in which Magnus Hirschfeld's project at the so-called Institute for Social Forschung, the Institute for Social, Sexual Research, rather, um, was it was taken up in Jill Soloway's series, Transparent, in the second season, in which he, and tapped into to, to, to that Weimar, their story Weimar era, and specifically Hirschfeld. And I, I'm curious, and, and this is maybe for any, any, any one of you, but Manuel, you're sitting right next to me, so maybe <laughs> there's a way that you might want to weigh in on this question. How this legacy uh, remains alive today? Well, uh, I think the um, one way of thinking about this, and, and I think one of, one of the reasons that you know, seeing this print uh, up on screen now, uh, it just reminds me how queer history is sort of always um, in need of being recovered. That sort of seeing this fragmented print that had to come from all these different places and that had to be sort of fought over and that even though it was, you know, uh, reportedly destroyed, it still lives on and it lives on because of the, um, like the work of so many people. I think just seeing that on the screen, actually, I think it's a reminder of how queer history is made, that it's constantly uncovered, and it's, it's a constant process, uh, that it's very different than, you know, it's just written in the history books, because it was quite literally wanting to be erased. Uh, and I think that's, uh, it's something that comes through even in the first moments of the, of the film, when he, uh, when Paul is sort of uh, trying to see himself as already part of a line something that goes back to Wilde, something that goes back, uh, you know, we hear Zola, and then like, at the end, it's sort of echoed again in that, you know, we need to do this for the people who come before us, for the people who are here, for the people who are coming after. So I think that the, the cyclical nature of the, like, returning to, first of all, like, returning to the Weimar era, or even just returning to uh, this type of um, histories, I think, I think it's precisely what, what queer history is about. Actually, did you want to end up curious also, again, if we can return perhaps to the preservation nature. I don't know how much, you know, Chris Horak is, was interviewed. He was interviewed before the film premiered in Berlin, Knowledge in February of this, of this year. And, and he was asked about, you know, choices that one makes. And when he was trying to provide the text from the lectures, for example, from Magnus Hirschfeld, 
I, I'm wondering how much is revisionist, and, and you know, you need to make certain decisions, and you were talking about the question of language and for that nature, but I wonder whether you can maybe say a few words about this. Well, in this case, I don't think we'll ever know for sure what which slides Hirschfeld had originally included. Um, you know, there's, unless somebody's grandma has a print in her basement, <laughs> everybody ask your grandma to be yeah. the print of this, uh, or, you know, if there's a, a cache of, um, if anyone's seen, um, the new Bill Morrison film, Dawson City, Frozen Time. Sometimes you'll um, come across a, a swimming pool full of, um, you know, nitrate prints from the, the teens in um, Frozen and around in Alaska. So uh, unless that happens, I think this is as close as we're going to get to um, the original uh, release as possible. Um, and there's, yes, there is a responsibility to the preservationists to um, make those decisions and to say, uh, you know, based on Richfield's writing or based on um, uh, what the inner titles that do exist said uh, to try to piece together those, uh, what is a masculine man versus a feminine man and, you know, which, which pictures in this book do I choose? Um, sometimes the decision is made for you. There's only one still, so that's the still that you use. Yeah. Um, but yes, it is sometimes difficult. Go ahead, I was just going to ask a question about the intertitles, and it's, there's probably an obvious answer to this that I missed, but what was, what's the difference between the white text and the green titles? The, the white text was um, explanatory for footage that was missing to explain what was happening in the, in the missing scenes, and then the green was the, the dialogue. But sometimes there was dialogue in the white text, wasn't there quoted dialogue? I don't think that that was what was in the original. I think that was reconstructed. So that would, he would have, um, Chris would have pulled that from you know, the, um, the censorship, yeah, censorship, censorship, files. censorship records. Yeah. Files that he used, which are pretty meticulously kept. I mean, that's what made it possible to really, and it's like one of the many dark ironies of history is that is they kept such meticulous censorship files that you were able to use those. <laughs> 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 and sometimes there's even uh, images in those, in those yeah, files. Yeah, it's not yeah. just uh, text. It's, Rob, you want to say something? I was just going to say to the point of preserving history when we were making paragraph 175 and having to represent the Weimar era and the, um, the social life, the very vibrant social life that was going on in Berlin at the time, gay social life. There was just a paucity of material. There's really nothing out there um, except for a few still images which we were able to get from the Schulis Museum in Berlin, the gay museum. Um, so this film is such an important artifact for that reason alone, the fact that it is documentation of, of that period, it's, yeah. it's so important. Yeah, I think that, 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 that again returns to what Manuel was saying about the system, the, the, kind of the archival significance of this, again, and kind of tracing a genealogy, not only of queer cinema, but of queer life in, gen in general. Maybe this would be an appropriate moment, too, to open up the floor for some questions from the audience. I see a number of hands and shot right up. How, Nick, are you still here? How will we best do this? I'm happy to actually stand up and, and you're closest. So.